What's up folks, this is Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards back with another video for you. Today I'm just going to do a little freeform solo role playing with the Shadow Dark RPG. I'm going to be using the one page Mythic emulator and I'm going to be playing in my homebrew campaign of the Isle of Avalonia. If you want a copy of that, just shoot me an email and I'll get you a copy. But Let's go ahead and get started, and we're going to start creating a character just as it is shown in the book. We're going to roll stats straight down the line. So we have a 9 in strength. An 11 in dex. A 10 in con. Five in intelligence. We don't have a wizard here. A six in wisdom. Not a cleric either. And a ten in charisma. So uh, overall, no bonuses and some significant uh, negatives here. So we got a minus two, a minus three. We've got nothing, 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 and a minus one to strength. Luckily, in Shadow Dark, the attribute modifiers aren't quite as important as they are in traditional BX D and D games. But looking at these stats, I am going to be kind of limited on what kind of a role I can put this character into. Next up, I'm going to have to choose. An ancestry and I think I am gonna go with a dwarf. I have the eyes of a hawk and the ears of a fox here and mainly because I'm gonna be looking at this character probably as some ablative wounds and a dwarf gets to roll hit points with advantage so that's what we're gonna do with this one and we are going to go ahead and make them, even with a minus one for their strength, we're going to go ahead and still make them a fighter. And then we will pull out the rule book and go to the fighter section. And we're going to roll hit points. Gets a d8, but gets to roll them twice because it's a dwarf. Hey, I don't even need to roll them twice. So eight hit points, that's not bad. And I think he gets plus two as well. Um, let's look here. Um, apologize, looking for... The Ancestors, there we go, plus two, yep. So he's going to start with 10 hit points. That's pretty nice. Um, he is going to get a single talent to start the game with. Roll to six, plus one to melee and ranged attacks. So melee and ranged. I'm just going to put level one there. And then his special abilities. Um, he has hauler. Which he adds a constitution modifier to his gear slots. He doesn't have a constitution modifier, so that does not help him right now. Um, he has weapon mastery. So we're going to give him Weapon Mastery with, let's do, hmm. he is a dwarf, so let's do Great Axe, even though he is a weak dwarf. Which is of course ridiculous! So, plus one hit and damage with those. 
So he's getting plus two to hit, minus one for his strength, but plus one to damage. Strength does not apply to damage in um, Shadow Dark. He's definitely going to have a great axe. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down now while I'm thinking about it. I'll have to deduct the gold later. Uh, great Axe is versatile, so it is 1d8 or 1d10, depending on if you do one or two-handed. And he will get a plus one to hit, plus two to damage. Again, he's getting plus one to hit, plus two to hit, but minus one to hit there. And he's getting plus one. Oh, I guess he's only getting plus one to damage, because he's only got one thing that adds damage. So I guess it's plus one and plus one. My bad. So then we need to check a to get a background for him. Let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna roll d20. Got an eight. He is a jeweler. That's kind of appropriate for a dwarf. And we are going to say. More it in just because that's a dwarf god. We are going to make him neutral. We're going to say he's all about making money. And for his title, that's determined by his alignment and class. So a neutral war, uh, neutral fighter of first level is going to be a warrior. And then his languages is determined by his ancestry. So he knows common and dwarvish. write that up there because apparently there's no spot on character sheet for that. And then starting gear, he gets 2d6 times 5 gold pieces. Ah, appropriate for a jeweler. So he got 50 gold pieces, but he is going to have a crawling kit, which gives him a backpack. Flint and steel. Uh, torch. Uh, another torch. Rations. Times three. You only take up one spot. Iron spikes. Times 10. Those are for closing doors and keeping them closed. Uh, grappling hooks. Or hook, rather. And 60 foot of rope. So of his 50 gold pieces, that costs 7. So that puts him down to 43. His great axe cost him 10, so that gives him 33. Um, and then he's going to buy some armor. Uh, he cannot afford anything more than leather, so he is going to have some leather armor, which is just as well because he um, looks like he can only carry one more thing. So um, Leather armor gives him a base AC of 11 plus his dex mod, which is zero. And the leather armor cost him 10, puts him down to 23. Let's see. Shield would be another 10. We're going to do that. And that will give him an extra point of AC, make him a little bit more survivable yet. So despite the awful stats here, like I said, he got no bonuses, no bonus modifiers, and he got a total of negative six 
but I rolled really well for his hit points. And he got two points extra because he's a dwarf. So he's got 10 hit points, decent AC, and he's got a great axe, and he gets a plus one to hit and damage. This is a first level character. This is not terrible despite the stats. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and roll a name by syllable off of the uh, screen. 13 is Mel. 16 is Ur. And 2 is N. So Nelern. So that's what we're going to go with. And that's going to be my first character. I'm going to make a couple of these. I think I'll make three of them, maybe. We'll have three characters. So, got a 12. We're already off to a better start here. Uh, a 10. A 9 in con. That's going to be a minus 1 to hit points. That's not good. A 10 in intelligence. And a 9 in wisdom. And a 7 in charisma. So we got a minus 2, a minus 1, nothing. Minus one to con, nothing, and a plus one. Again, not great stats. Um, We're going to go with a, is it a half work in this or is it an orc? It is a half work. So we're going to do a half work here. Because my other guy was kind of a tanky guy. This is, again, kind of uh, bog standard uh, fighter stats here. So we're going to we're gonna stick with a fighter with minus one whiz, minus two charisma. Uh, not a bonus to intelligence. Didn't feel like a, a healer, really. So we're going to roll hit points. I got an eight again. He's on fire! So, you know, nothing else is going well for me, but this D8, I am going to save that guy because it is rolling quite well. So, um, orcs are mighty. And so they get a plus one to hit and damage with melee. And he's going to get an extra plus one to hit because he's strong. And then we're going to roll for his fighter talent. I got a seven. Plus two to strength, dexterity, or constitution stat. So I could raise his... Oh, and his con is actually a, a minus one, so that would bring him down to a seven hit points. I could raise his con to, keep, to get his hit points back up to eight, uh, which is what I rolled. I think I'll leave his hit points at seven, and I'm going to go all ham on the strength, and we're going to give him another plus... Two to strength, which gives him a plus two to hit there. So he's going to be really good at hitting things. And next up, uh, we're going to choose his background. And background table. D20, a 7, Wizard's Apprentice. So he was a Wizard's Apprentice before he was an adventurer. Interesting. Maybe adopted. Uh, maybe not uh, not fitting in with either of his parents and, and went to live with a wizard as an assistant. Uh, we're going to go neutral with this character too. He is going to be about the money as well. And we're going to leave his deity blank for now. Uh, he's also a warrior because he's a first level neutral fighter. And we'll roll for his gold. Nine. He got 45 gold. That's pretty good too. So um, he's got 38 left after the uh, crawler 
Packers pack. Just give me that backpack. Flint and steel. A torch. Another torch. Rations. Times three. Iron spikes. Times ten. A grappling hook. Uh, 60 foot of rope. And that's it. Okay, so, but then we are going to need to look at, and this is one of the handy end papers in the book. Um, so, this and this is the front of the book in papers, and this and this is the back of the book in papers. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a great sword for him, and we do need to choose his weapon mastery. So we'll do weapon mastery, great sword. Which is plus one hit and damage. So if I can keep him alive, he's going to get plus two to hit and damage, and another plus two to hit. So he's going to get great sword. Plus four to hit. Plus two to damage. And the great sword is a D12, but it does take two slots. So that, oh, the backpack actually doesn't take a spot. So I actually did cheat myself there. So I still will have enough left to get some leather armor. And actually, I've got my strength there that I can, I can carry a little bit more because he's very strong. So my great sword cost me 12, my leather cost me 10, that's 22. So I have 16 gold left. All right, uh, let's roll a name. Uh, first, we've got Seer. Seer Sore. Tuh. Seer, sort. Okay. You sound it out, it kind of uh, sounds like a seer that would look into in the future. So, with him being a wizard's apprentice, that kind of makes sense. Um, did I roll his... Yes, I got his talent, because his talent... Was to strength so far. That was his level one talent. All right, let's do one more character. So we'll do a, char uh, a party of three characters here. So we've got 10 strength. Ooh, here we go. We got a thief. We got a 14 dex. We got a nine con. That's not going to be very survivable. Fifteen intelligence. So maybe this is a wizard. Eight, nine wisdom. That could be a wizard. And a five charisma. This is just the most unlikable group of misfits that you're ever going to meet. I've got all three of them with negatives to their charisma modifier. Uh, they're not particularly healthy either because two of them have negatives to their constitution. But um, they all have their own niche within the party. So I need to choose a, an ancestry and for... This particular character, I think, 
I am going to choose an elf. And I'm going to choose, so Farsight is the elven ability. And I'm going to choose plus one to spellcasting. This is important in Shadow Dark because if you fail your spellcasting roll, you can no longer cast that spell until you rest. Uh, let's roll my hit points. Don't get a one. Hey, I got a four. Man, my hit points are just killing it. So I got three hit points because I've got a minus one for my con. The constitution modifier is only at first level, so um, that's not too damaging. So I am a wizard. Let's go to the wizard section of the book here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and roll a talent. I got a nine. Gain advantage on casting one spell that you know. And I know three spells. They're all rank one. And I'm going to have advantage on one of them. Um, I didn't write down my languages for my half work, but I can get that later. To be honest with you, whenever I'm playing these games, typically the language uh, barrier does not come up in a solo game because it's just uh, another thing to deal with. We'll go ahead and get my title while I'm here. And for a level one wizard, that is, yeah, you guessed it, neutral. These guys are all going to be about the money. They're all a bunch of mercenaries, a bunch of unliked mercenaries. So he is a shaman. That kind of makes sense. Maybe he was an outcast as well. I didn't get my background, so I need to roll that. And an 18 on the background table is a scholar. Well, that's appropriate. And deity we're going to skip right now. Okay. Um, wizards in this do not have the ability to wear armor. So my AC is going to be 10 plus my dex, which is 12, which actually makes my AC as good as anybody in the group. So let's go ahead and get my spells. And I get three spells. I am going to do... You got to do sleep, right? That's always a popular one. And I am going to do light. Because this game, light is extremely important. Nobody has infravision except for the monsters. And then I could do either protection from evil, magic missile, mage armor, tech magic. Uh, charm person, uh, that might not be bad with our terrible, uh, terrible charisma stats. Burning hands, uh, let's do burning hands. That'll be interesting. Burning hands might offer some narrative uh, advantages that, like, say, a magic missile would not. So, my attacks, let's go ahead and roll my... Gold, we got five times five, 25 gold. And we're going to have a crawler kit, which will bring us down to 18. So I'll have my backpack, uh, flint and steel, a torch, another torch. Uh, rations times three iron spikes times ten a grappling hook and sixty foot of rope and that's just what comes in the crawler kit if you buy that for seven gold it's a pretty good uh, start for any character 
Now, I am going to carry a staff, which is good for that D4 damage. And that costs me half a gold. Um, so, I'll just take a whole gold off for it. Ah, wait, there's a spot on here for silver. So, 17 and 5. Okay. So, uh, I needed to choose one of these that I was going to have advantage while casting. And we're going to do that on sleep, because I think that will probably be a make or break spell for the group from time to time. The others probably not so much. And I had forgotten to roll a name for our elf. So we'll go ahead and do that. Uh, number three, his name is going to start with Seer as well. Second one, Ish. And third one, Din. Sirish Din. So perhaps this elven wizard is actually the same wizard that made Seersort his apprentice, and that's why their names start with Seer. Maybe that is a family uh, tradition for this elf. Maybe his family is no longer around, and that's the reason he adopted this half-orc. So we have Nellern, the dwarf fighter, uh, who wields a great axe and wears his leather armor and shield, and he is not exceptionally gifted, uh, but he is pretty wealthy for a first-level character. Um, we've got Seersort, the half-orc fighter, wielding his great sword. He's quite skilled with that, and he's quite strong, though he is not exceptionally hardy, and perhaps that's because he was raised by Sirishdin, who is also not very hardy, uh, but is quite adept at casting sleep. And there are the characters that we're going to run with for this session. Okay, we're going to say that the characters all know each other, and we're not going to go through the whole meet the characters in the bar kind of thing. So we're just going to uh, go ahead and generate an adventure with the Adventure Generator tool. And so we're going to roll a d20. Got a 10 for the first one. We're going to deliver the... Eight, the demon, blackmailing the baron. Deliver the demon, blackmailing the baron. And before I really define that, I'm going to go ahead and generate the name of the adventure site because that might give me some insight into what deliver the demon, blackmailing the baron means. So we've got a 19, Necropolis of the Deepwood. Borderlands. Necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands. So we're going to pull out the handy dandy map of the Isle of Avalonia as well as my little printed book of the Isle of Avalonia in case we have some questions. This is a setting that I created uh, to be system agnostic uh, a couple years ago and just updated this map a few months ago. So I'm thinking that the necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands would have to be somewhere in Nottingshire Forest. Uh, Nottingshire is also a uh, community of demi-humans, so it would make sense with our party that that might be a place that they would be um, kind of headquartered around. So I'm thinking it would be maybe up by the Silent Slopes, and this is perhaps a long forgotten uh, ruin, the necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands, and deliver the demon blackmailing the Baron. Well, I'm thinking that the demon blackmailing the Baron uh, may or may not be an actual demon, but there is a sheriff of Nottingshire, and um, perhaps that is who put us up to this task. Maybe there is something in the necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands 
that is causing him heartburn, and we are to go dispatch uh, whatever is causing problems. Uh, there is, within the campaign, an issue with some um, outlaws robbing uh, travelers that are traveling between Chapeltown and Thrackold to Nottingshire. So maybe he thinks they're held up within the necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands, and that is where our characters are going to head to. But before we do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about One Page Mythic. Now, just like all my other videos, if I don't say that I got a product for free, then it was not a donated product. These are my real opinions on things that I spent my hard-earned cash on. And One Page Mythic is no exception there. I bought this. It's extremely cheap. It's a couple bucks on DriveThruRPG. Of course, I laminate it because that's what I do. And what this is, is it takes the essence of the mythic system and boils it down to a single page. It also has a very nice um, like 10 or 11 page instructions uh, for using the one page mythic to its best ability, but it has the oracle, it has a different manner of handling random events, and it has a couple of action and description uh, tables. So that is what I'm going to be using for creating content while our characters are traveling to the necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands and attempting to take care of the demon blackmailing the Baron, which we have determined is actually somebody that's uh, giving a hard time to the Sheriff of Nottingshire. So our three intrepid mercenaries, they're not really heroes, these guys are mercenaries, they will be making their way across Nottingshire Forest, which they are familiar with. We've determined that they're probably from this area to the Silent Slopes to make a, uh, a an attempt to travel through uh, the necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands. So we're going to say that with their knowledge of the area and where they're starting from, this is going to be probably a good day's travel. And Nottingshire Forest is not a completely safe place to be um, traveling. We're going to roll one time, and if we get a one, we're going to have a random encounter. And we did not. So we make it through Nottingshire Forest in a day. We're going to set up camp, and we are going to uh, use one ration each. And we are going to rest before we head down into the necropolis. Now that does give us only two rations, so we can't spend several days in the necropolis unless we are able to come up with some extra food. Um, I am going to say that they went ahead and used their flint and steel and gathered some wood from the uh, Nottingshire Forest and made their fire that way. So, now this is going to be a very neat uh, exercise here because we're going to generate a uh, adventure site using a random table here in the book. And that's what this table here is going to do. And let me go grab some paper, I'm gonna pause the video, and I'll be right back. I am going to apologize. I keep accidentally bumping my camera and adjusting it between uh, recordings, but I wanted to get a good angle on this. So let me show you this again really quick, and then I'm going to take it away. But this is the uh, random generator for a an adventure site. We are going to not roll for the size because I think this is going to have to be a small one in order for the video link and also because uh, the sheriff would not have sent such inexperienced mercenaries on a larger adventure. So we're going to just go ahead and roll and I'll show you how this table works. So we're going to roll for a danger level first and it is unsafe which is the lowest level of danger 
And that's probably good for us. And then with a uh, small site, you drop 5D10s onto a sheet of paper. And this one fell off, so we're going to go there. Okay, so then you actually build out the dungeon, kind of drawing some rooms around the dice. based on where they landed, and then you connect them with passages or tunnels or whatnot. Like these could be stairs maybe going down, since this is the necropolis. And then each die number is going to determine what type of a room that is. Now, in this particular case, um, I'm going to set up some rules ahead of time so that I don't take advantage of the system. We're going to say that Nellern, my dwarf, is going to always be in front. He's always looking for traps, and he's always fiddling with anything that is in his way, which will mean that um, he's going to be easy to spot, uh, but we should not be taken uh, surpri by surprise for traps, because in Shadow Dark, if you're looking for traps, you find them. So he is searching the rooms, and he's taking his time. And he's up front, so he's going to be uh, the one that is taking damage. So we arrived at the Necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands, and number two is the type of room here, and this is an empty room. So this room is empty. But let's go ahead and roll what that means. So I am going to roll... 62 on action, which says increase. But I still don't know what that means. And, and with one page mythic, you just keep rolling until it means something. So 71, I'm going to go over to the description. Uh, increase peaceful. Uh, okay, so there it's very quiet. Um, there's absolutely nothing here. And I think being that this was named the Necropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands, Perhaps this is an old uh, tomb, and it's not really a city of the dead, as Necropolis would suggest, but this is a long abandoned tomb, and there's nothing at all here, and it's very eerie uh, as we have disturbed this place. So we are going to go ahead and allow uh, Sarishtin to attempt to cast light on his staff. Um, so that we will have some light to go through this uh, necropolis. And in Shadow Dark, light is an extremely important element, and it is actually tied to a real-world timer of an hour for my light spell or for torches. And there are things within dungeons that can cause lights to go out, but... Right now, we're just going to go ahead and roll my spell to see if I successfully cast it. And I do not get advantage on that. I get advantage on sleep. So let's go ahead and roll that. It is a rank 1 spell, so I need a DC 11 roll. And I get plus 1 for being an elf and plus 2 for my high intelligence. So I'm getting plus 3. I need to get an 8 or better. And I got a 3. Inconceivable! So I cannot cast light until I rest. So I'm going to have to use one of my torches, which leaves one left. So I've got one torch that started right now. In a regular game, I would start a timer right now. And when an hour was reached, I would have to either light a new torch or I would be in the dark. And it's actually mentioned that you shouldn't let uh, players have a timer that they can see so they don't know when the torch is going to go out so they're more uh, careful and they, they actually light the torches a little earlier than they have to so they're not completely efficient there. But I've lit my tor torch with my flint and steel. Uh, Sarishtin is, uh, is going to be doing that. He's going to put his staff back on his back and carry the torch so that the group can see. And we are going to make our way down those stairs and find out what's in the next room. And that room is a six, and that is an NPC. 
and I could use One Page Mythic to create an NPC, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the NPC creator within Shadow Dark. And so let's go ahead and roll. And we're going to roll a d12 for Ancestry. It's 12, it's a goblin. And we're going to roll, let's see if this rolls anything but an 8. It rolled an 8 again. That is three 8s in a row. Is this weighted? No. Okay, it's not. Uh, ancient. Uh, it is an Ancient Goblin. And a d6 for alignment. He's chaotic. Now, chaotic's not necessarily evil. It just means that he's not into order. And he is Standard Wealth. And we'll roll Appearance. It is a 10. He's willowy. And he is, he likes card tricks. And he is a half demon. Inconceivable. I rolled a five. So he's willowy, he does card tricks, and he is a half demon. And I will just remind you that the adventure was deliver the demon blackmailing the Baron. So this ancient goblin doing the card tricks is in this room right here. So we're going to go ahead and just put a little monster head down here. And that is our half demon goblin. And let's go ahead and ask the Oracle, um, is he aggressive towards us? And I think it is unlikely just because of the the fact that he's an ancient goblin i think he's probably going to try to be more uh more evasive um so we'll say it's unlikely but we'll go ahead and roll 96 that is an exceptional no he is not aggressive uh not aggressive at all in fact uh, that kind of means that he's probably spooked by us and will be um, off to the races. And so I guess what we will say is that as we descend the stairs and we come into the room, what does the room look like, by the way? A 59, uh, help, 78, uh, Quiet and 24, control. Help, quiet, control. So I think that this is kind of like a, a prayer room uh, that visitors that would visit the sarcophagi would come to to say their peace before entering to visit their lost loved ones. And that is how it helps to... Um, to increase their peace. Uh, so what I'm going to say is that this goblin, when he sees us, this half-demon goblin, he skitters off through the door, and he makes his way out before we are able to capture him. Now, we could chase after him, or we could slowly make our way through the room and not expose ourselves to greater danger. And I think that's what we're going to do. You have chosen wisely. So we, we kind of cautiously make our way uh, through this prayer room and um, we observe the walls uh, that have murals depicting um, the families that have buried their dead here for generations and everything is musty and aged and ancient like this half-demon goblin. And so we're going to make our way to the next room, and the next room is an eight. So an eight for the rooms is a major hazard. So let's roll a d6 to find out what that major hazard is. A long fall. 
So the goblin was trying to perhaps trick us into following him, and there's actually a big uh, a pit uh, that's in this next room. And um, so since we had said we were taking our time and we're looking very carefully, and you find traps if you are looking for them automatically in this game, we're going to say that we found this long fall. Problem is, we found it. How do we get across this pit? And what kind of a room is this? 29. Deceit. Yep, that makes sense. And 96. That is stylish deceit. Let's go ahead and go with another uh, description. 97. Uh, valuable, stylish deceit. Um, so perhaps um, this is a room uh, that has um, treasures within it um, that would be quite valuable and they're distracting. And um, if you're not paying attention, um, you would be walking right to your doom uh, as there is a, a pit right as you come into the room, and but you're distracted by the mass uh, riches that were left by the families. And, and this is probably something that they would use to detract uh, the um, desirability of Tomb Raiders to come to this uh, this mausoleum as well. So we have this problem. Um, we don't know. Let's see. Is is the the pit uh, as it were? Is it less than twenty feet? I think that that's fifty fifty. So we're gonna roll, and we got a twelve. Um, so that is a yes. It is less than fifty or less than twenty feet. Is it less than ten feet? And eighty three. That's a no. So this is probably about a 10-foot pit that we're going to have to get across in order to make it to the next room. Is the goblin still in here? Is he on, is he on the other side of the pit, um, or has he already made it to the next room? I think it's very likely that he is still in there kind of taunting us, uh, seeing if we would fall in, and then seeing how we're going to try to get across. But we'll, we'll, we'll check with the oracle. And I got an 04, an exceptional yes. So the goblin is, uh, the half-demon goblin, is kind of taunting us. And uh, perhaps he even uh, takes a uh, golden goblet off of the pile of treasure and fills it with some wine and takes a, a swig before he heads into the next room. So my, my intrepid... Uh, mercenaries are going to have to figure out a way to get over this 10-foot pit. I do have a grappling hook. Uh, actually, I actually have three grappling hooks and rope. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to allow Sarishtin, who is the wizard, to make a dexterity check to try to hook the grappling hook on the other side uh, onto a nice, sturdy a uh, piece of furniture or something, and see if we can get across that way. So we're going to say that is going to be an average difficulty, which is a DC 12 in this game. And we have really pretty good tools for all of this with the grappling hook and the rope and whatnot. So I'm going to give myself advantage on this. Right. And I need to get a 12, which is going to be a 10 because I've got a dexterity bonus of 2. And I, because I have advantage, I got it. So we throw the grappling hook across, and we make our way across. And then we're going to go into the next room, which is a 3. Let's see what a 3 is in the generation table. And this is a trap. And as I said, the dwarf is up front for all of these traps, uh, looking for them, but it can still get caught by one. So let's go ahead and roll 
2d6 to see what the trap is. Six and a five. It is a large magical trap, so it won't matter that he can see it because it's magical. It is something that's just going to go off as we enter the room and no avoiding getting it to uh, be triggered. So let's go ahead and roll to see what kind of a trap it is. It's a one. Um, so it's a tripwire, and it's 1d6 damage and blind. So let's go ahead and give the characters an opportunity. Since this is a magical attack, I'm going to say it's going to be a, an intelligence check. And we're going to say that the blind and d6 damage, it's because there is a, uh, an exceedingly bright light uh, when you go in to this room. Maybe it's a magic mirror uh, that, that shoots a blinding light as you enter the room, and uh, you must be uh, very humble and, and avert your eyes as you enter the room or you'll be blinded. So we're going to do a... Average difficulty, which is DC 12, need a 10 or better with the elf. Did not make it. He is blind and takes a D6 damage. I call Kenny Loggins because you're in the danger zone. Uh, let's see how much he takes. Five. He is at zero health. So let's see how many rounds he gets. He gets a D4 plus his con modifier. He has one round to live. So the elf may be dead here. If he dies, he dies. Let's go ahead and roll a check for uh, Seersort, the half-orc. He needs a 12 or better. Hey, he gets it. So he's up. And um, let's say Nellern. Nellern fails. He is blinded. And he takes one damage of his 10 hit points. So he is good to go. He's got nine hit points left, but he's blind. Um, let's see how long he's blinded for. Let's do a D4. Three rounds he's blinded for. And the first round, we're going to have the half-orc try to stabilize Sarishtin. But first, Sarishtin gets to roll to see if he gets a 20. Um, then he just he, he wakes up. He did not get a 20. So let's go ahead and let Searsort have his one chance to get a 15 or better intelligence roll to try to save Sarishtin. And here we go. And no, after all of that, Sarishtin is dead already. All right, so you guys may think I am just a uh, masochist that enjoys killing my players, uh, but I enjoy killing my own characters too. And we're going to use this nice cause of death stamp and get to write a reason that he died. And I usually put a funny version of what actually happened. And I'm going to say he was blinded by the light. Oh, come on. That was damn funny. As it were. And that is the end of Sirishtin. And so then, there were two. Um, now, Nelern is blinded for another two rounds, which will give him disadvantage on everything else that he does. Now, in this blinded state, is there a chance that the half-demon goblin would take advantage of that and attack now? I think there is. I think it's likely that he would not wait for us in the other room. Um, so let's go ahead and roll. So we're going to go roll likely. And we got a 92. Um, likely 92. That is a no. So maybe there's more to this goblin than I've given him credit for. He has made his way to the final room of the Necropolis. And so we are going to, um, I guess, try to wait out and 
um, if we if we take our time and let um, Nellern get his vision back, uh, kind of do a Jack Burton uh, in Big Trouble in Little China in the alley scene. Hey, what more can a guy ask for? And, and try to get his vision back. Then is the goblin going to come and try to take advantage of us? Um, we'll say that's 50-50. Let's see. 31. Yes, he's not going to allow us to do that. So, um, so we get one round off of that. So we're still going to have a round left where Nelern is blinded. But let's go ahead and create a half-demon goblin monster. We're going to go ahead and use the statistics for an imp. This should be a good challenge for the group. Um, this imp is going to have a, an AC of 13, hit points of 9, um, a stinger, uh, which is plus 3 to hit, and does a d4 damage and poison. Uh, and he's immune to fire, so the wizard's uh, burning hands wouldn't have been much good anyways. And he can fly, and he can grant mighty boons and patronage on behalf of an archdevil in exchange for a sworn soul. So, um, and maybe, would that be something that the demon goblin would offer since he knows that the elf has been lost? Um, would he be interested in um, trying to buy the elf's soul? I think that is very likely. So we got a 51 here. And that's a yes. He really would. Um, so he is going to offer to Sirsort and Nellern that he would buy the soul of Sirishtin and perhaps let us just make our way out. But I think that um, Seersort, who was adopted by Sirishtin, is not going to allow that to even be considered, and he is going to invoke his uh, mighty half-orc heritage to go ahead and attack the impish half, or half goblin, half demon. And so we're now, initiative in Shadow Dark is determined actually at the beginning of the game and it stays the same and then just goes in clockwise order. I didn't do that up front, so we're just gonna start with Seersort and make our way clockwise until we get to the goblin. So Seersort can make one move action up to near, which is equivalent to around 30 feet, and he can attack or do one other action. And he is going to attack. He's going to use his great sword, and let's see what happens. And he got a 10. He's going to add 4 to hit, so he got a 14 against an AC of 13, so he hits. And let's see how he does on damage. He gets a d12, and he got a 9 plus 2, so he did 11 damage on his first hit of a possible 13 hit points. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, his nine hit points. So he actually just cuts this thing in half uh, right off the bat. Now, there is a 50% chance that the goblin demon would have no treasure in this game. So we're gonna roll 50% or less, and he has no treasure. Uh, so he has no treasure on him. So um, we do have the head of the half-goblin, half-demon that we can take back to claim our prize from the Sheriff of Nottingshire, but we still have another room left, and um, you know we, it seems a shame uh, that we've lost one of our compatriots and we have nothing to show for it just yet. So let's go ahead and check out that other room. Same as usual, the dwarf is going ahead. And a number six, it's another NPC. So let's go ahead and roll up another NPC and see who it is. It is six, that is an elf, interesting. And it is a elven child. So what is an elven child doing in the bottom of this metropolis? And it is a lawful elven child that it has standard wealth. Let's go ahead and roll some characteristics. 12. 
a cleft chin, odd for an elf, makes puns, and is a half demon. Inconceivable! You keep using the horn. I do not think it means what you think it means. I rolled that on both times. So, this is another half demon, but it's an elven child. So, maybe this is actually the one that we were supposed to bring back. Um, so, let's see if we can. Um, well, let, first, let's find out um, what the room is like. So, 11 change. 95. Stylish, though. And 71. Peaceful. So we go back to peaceful. So this room here was peaceful. This was peaceful. And this was peaceful. But these specifically, I did not roll that. So that makes sense because we had a pit trap and there was a big distraction with the treasure hoard. We came in here, there was the magical mirror that uh, blinded us with light and seared the elves' eyes out. Um, and then we come back here and there is this uh, half-demon, half-elven child uh, playfully pun making puns. And um, it's a lawful uh, uh, creature, so not going to be aggressive off the bat. And being that it's a elven child, um, I think that we could probably try to convince it to come with us. Now, given um, Seersort has a minus two to reaction rolls, but actually um, Nellern is zero. I thought he had a negative there. He had a negative on everything else. So um, let's go ahead and roll a reaction table. Uh, and I think because we have um, killed the chaotic uh, half-goblin, half-demon. Um, we should get a bonus to that. So we're going to roll. Um, we're going to roll this advantage. So we're going to roll it twice and take the better of the two. So a four uh, would be hostile, um, but a ten would not. Ten is curious, and so the 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 punning elf, half-elven, half-demon child is curious about us. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a ration to the child and convince him to come with us. And then as we make our way out, I am going to roll on the random treasure table. And let's go ahead and Pull that up. Um, let's see, it is towards the back. And this is going to be a level zero to three treasure. This is the best thing that we could find to carry with us out of the room that was full of treasure. And it was a cracked emerald. And a cracked emerald is worth 60 gold. And gold pieces are what determines um, your uh, experience points in this game. So um, we find this cracked emerald with 60 gold. Um, we are also uh, going to get some bonus XP for completing our quest. Uh, we do have to make our way back to town. We'll go ahead and roll a random encounter there. And we get one. So let's roll. Let's see what happens on the way back. We're going to say that we um, we make our way back. But, uh, but on the way, in the forest, we have a random encounter. We're going to roll in the random encounter table that comes with Shadow Dark. And we got a 47. 1d4 rusty bear traps spring out from beneath the leaf litter. Okay, so we wouldn't see these necessarily. And there are three of them, and just by coincidence, there are three of us. So we're going to make some dexterity checks. Unfortunately, my guy that had the good dexterity is no more. So we're going to make an 
we're, they're rusty, so I'm going to say it's going to be easier. So an easy roll is a 9. So with Nalern, he's got to roll a 9. He got an 11. He's good. And Searsort failed. Uh, so Rusty Bear Trap will take a d6. He takes 3 damage, uh, so he's got 4 left. Um, and I'll say that I was carrying the, um, the demon the demon elf, the lawful demon elf, uh, which we need to give a name to. So 10 is Gar, Garon, Garonk. So uh, Garonk is, Garonk, like Gronkowski, uh, Garonk is the lawful half-demon elf, child that we are bringing back to the Sheriff of Nottingshire. And when we get there, we are also going to collect our um, fabulous reward, uh, which happened to be a, another treasure that we will roll randomly. And we'll go ahead and roll on, we'll roll two different treasures on the zero to three. So 39. A pair of elf forged short swords. So elven short swords times two. And those are worth 14 gold pieces. And oh six. Ten copper pieces in a greasy pouch. That was kind of an insult. Um, but uh, that's going to give us 2 XP, and uh, we need 10 to level up, so we are still first level. But um, we have a little bit of experience. Um, we have defeated the, uh, the tricksy half-goblin, half-demon, and we have saved Garonk, the lawful half-demon elf child, and brought it back to the safety of Nottingshire. Uh, there was uh, likely a, um, a mother involved here that was wanting her child back that had been captured by uh, this half-goblin, half-demon creature. I'm going to say that is nearly certain. Let's roll and find out. O three, 3 an exceptional yes. So this is actually probably a noble within the town of Nottingshire that we saved their child that was uh, turned into a half-demon by this tricksy goblin and that took it to the Decropolis of the Deepwood Borderlands. And we are now uh, uh, characters of some level of notoriety, at least within the, the family of the elven child. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of... Uh, therapy sessions to explain away uh, the horns poking through the child's head, but that is going to be for another session. All right, so that was my hour alone in the Shadow Dark. Uh, we had created our heroes. We even lost one of them. We defeated the bad. We traveled through a random dungeon, and we really looked at how the Shadow Dark toolkit works and with minimal interference from the emulator because the one-page mythic emulator is a very simple tool that is very transportable and quick to use. So if you want an emulator that doesn't get in the way, this might be a good one to try out. And if you want an RPG that is quick, easy to run, and a lot of fun, Shadow Dark would be a great choice for you. A great thing about Shadow Dark is you could easily grab old AD&D or basic D&D &D modules and you could just use them whole cloth. You wouldn't have to make any changes. So if you're running Shadow Dark, let me know how it's going for you. If you're running it solo, I would really like to hear what you're doing with it in your solo games. So if you've been enjoying the content, I would appreciate it if you'd uh, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. We're on the march to 3,000 subs. I'd really like to get there before I go to Jerry... Uh, Emotional damage! Uh, Gary Con, And um, that would be a fantastic way to break in the new year is hitting 3,000 this early. 
Until next time, this has been Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards. Good gaming. God bless.